I could feel the warm, cleansing blood of Jesus flowing over me. I could feel his glorious, saving grace. And oh, glory be to God, I was saved. She was electric, sensual, irresistible. Amy Semple McPherson, evangelist. She soared to the top in the 1920s, building the magnificent Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. Her fresh, upbeat message of hope and prosperity won tens of thousands of converts. During the Depression, she rallied her church to feed and clothe those in need. But at the pinnacle of her success, Amy stumbled and fell from public grace. You're drifting away from the faith of your fathers. You're drifting away from prayer. Drifting away when she from was only 17, Amy found both religion and love in the handsome minister Robert Semple. They married and sailed to China as missionaries. There, Amy watched the love of her life die, tragically, of malaria. Heartbroken, penniless, with a newborn daughter, Amy fixed in her mind a picture-perfect dream of success, prosperity, and happiness. And she resolved that nothing would stop her. Production of the Los Angeles History Project is made possible in part by the Durfee Foundation, which is pleased to be supporting excellence in television production on KCET. The Michael J. Connell Foundation. The California Community Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life in Southern California for 75 years. The City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department. And by the Fletcher Jones Foundation. When Amy Semple McPherson was 25, no one would have predicted that she would soon be an international celebrity. She had settled down in New England with her second husband, Harold McPherson, and had a son, her second child. Amy tried to keep her traditional place in the home, but as her daughter Roberta remembers, she was a person who could never be content with the cleanest wash on the line or the best polished furniture in the house. There was more to living than, than just that. Amy longed for the excitement and passion she had felt with Robert Semple in China. Restless and unhappy, one day she left her new husband, she threw off the comforts of home, packed up her two children, and headed out on the road to become an itinerant preacher. It was a time when American women had not yet won the right to vote. Divorce was rare, but for a woman to take up preaching was almost unheard of. In Pentecostal religious circles, many believed that the Bible explicitly prohibited women from preaching. But every day and every night, Jesus spoke to my soul, now will you go? Preach, preach, preach the word of God. Despite all obstacles, Amy followed the call. She lived like a gypsy on the pennies from her collection baskets. Her son, Rolf, recalls that he and his sister grew accustomed to hand-me-down clothes and meals of cold canned corn and crackers. We lived in little tents often uh, by the side of the road. Uh, we lived in the midst of the storms and the lightning flashing and the tents would leak. Amy wouldn't give up. She asked her mother to become her business manager and the crowds grew. Polishing her preaching style, she blazed a trail of tent meeting revivals from Maine to Key West. But the grueling nomadic life she and her family led on the road was a heavy price to pay. And she said in desperation 
we're going to settle down. We're going to go to California, and we're going to have a home. Like so many thousands of others, Amy and her mother headed west to Los Angeles. They drove for 30 days. When the children tired, Amy would tell them about the beautiful promised land of California, with its sunny, healthful climate and booming prosperity, where God would give them their very own home. Roberta said, uh, well, Mother, do you think that I could have a canary bird? And uh, Mother said, well, if God can give us a home, he can give us canary bird. And I was kind of a little me too boy about that time. And I said, Mother, do you think I could have some rose bushes? And Mother said, yes, I think you could. There were only a half million people in Los Angeles when Amy arrived in 1918. But they called it the city of the second chance. And between 1920 and 1930, Los Angeles tripled in size. We came in the middle 20s. We came here when they were building highway number one. That's why my parents came here. My dad had a job working on highway number one. Howard Courtney later became a Bible college student in Amy's church. A fellow student, Lois Van Cleve, remembers her family's westward migration. But my mother now had to support us. And so she heard that in California, uh, women could not get less than $15 a week. That was a wage for women out here, which was much more than Missouri paid. Many of the newly arrived were Midwestern farmers, small shopkeepers, retired couples, often in ill health or worried about their financial security. Amy came from the same simple rural background with a similar history of hardship and troubles. She joined this migration, driving into town, owning only a gospel car, $100, and a tambourine. As a child growing up on a small farm in Canada, Amy had loved the spirited music and impressive uniforms of her mother's Salvation Army work. Years on the road helped her perfect her own unique brand of sensuous personal magnetism and theatrical preaching. Isn't it the most thrilling thing on earth? Woo! I wanted to holler and sing and shout. Now when they passed the collection baskets, there were more than pennies. In the city's atmosphere of abundance, Amy's followers pledged gifts and services, property and a bungalow, a canary for Roberta, a rose garden for Rolf. Amy had a home. She called it the house that God built. Amy saw her ambitious dream taking shape. The next step was a church of her own. Los Angeles was a flourishing haven for all forms of religion, from fringe cults to more subdued, mainstream denominations. Amy's faith was rooted in the Pentecostal church, but they were typically back alley, low-rent congregations. Amy rejected this and instead set her sights on the boulevard, finding a prime piece of land on the edge of Echo Park. With that, she went to the architects, the builders. She said, you know, I've got $5,000. How far will that go? They said, well, it'll dig the hole. Mother had said to these men, you know, you dig the hole and God will fill it up. Amy returned to her old revival circuit in order to raise the huge sum through a shrewd promotional campaign. She offered a tiny replica cement bag for each $1 donation. Covering the country, she sent money back from each town to Los Angeles where construction advanced. Within two years, she opened the doors to Angeles Temple debt-free. Amy and her mother personally owned the building outright. When Sister McPherson built Angelus Temple, many of the Pentecostal churches thought, oh, she's getting very worldly. And uh, why is she doing this, this fabulous building? You can imagine what that building loomed out to be in the 20s. 
But as soon as we arrived in California, we wanted to go visit Angel's Temple, which was now completed. There were hundreds of people outside on the street, and they couldn't get in the building. That meeting started off a half an hour for church with a 50-piece or more silver band. Then you got two big choirs, one on each side, and a song service that would almost make your hair stand on it. I mean, that thing would just rock. And then over on the side, Sister McPherson would walk down a long, there was a long ramp that led down to the platform. She usually carried a bouquet of roses, huge bouquet of roses, and she walked to the platform and walked out, and I thought, that's the most beautiful woman I ever saw in my life. It was the height of the Roaring Twenties, and Los Angeles was a sprawling boom town. Cars clogged the roads, oil rigs dotted the landscape, housing subdivisions sprouted in the middle of bean fields. The movie industry accentuated the prevalent Roaring Twenties atmosphere of fast living. And only ruin and a heartbreak and a homebreak lay in the direction of backsliding. Amy spoke out against this wide open living, but she also tried to replace its tempting diversions with her own. She held her audience transfixed for hours each Sunday with a display of music and song. But the centerpiece was her illustrated sermon, a biblical or topical story she would tell with the aid of elaborate sets and costumes. She wrote music to go with her sermons, hymns and musical pageants and sacred operas. Every week, she held a faith healing service. Ambulances would line up on the street as dozens of the ill and disabled arrived in wheelchairs, on crutches, and on stretchers. Many scoffed and branded Amy a charlatan, but those who believed became unswerving followers. And I'll never forget my first miracle, the first miracle I saw. This lady, rather large lady, but she came to the platform. She had a huge goiter that just hung down profusely. And um, when uh, Amy Simple McPherson prayed for her, that goiter completely disappeared. I saw it before my eyes. Amy's magnetic appeal also attracted the curious. Then, as members of other churches defected to Amy's, ministers began to see her as a threat. Her chief rival was the popular Bob Schuller, a fierce hellfire and brimstone Methodist preacher. Fighting Bob published an entire pamphlet condemning Amy's flamboyant preaching. He called her a fraud, a she-wolf in sheep's clothing but one, he said, who was the greatest advertising genius and publicity specialist on the earth. We thought, she shouldn't take that. That's not the truth, what he's saying. But she would just get up and she'd say, let's pray for Dr. Bob, you know, let's pray for him. Fighting Bob had won much of his success by playing upon the insecurities and ugly prejudices of his time, launching virulent attacks against Catholics and Jews. Amy welcomed all people, regardless of their race or faith. Newly arrived Angelinos especially embraced her joyous message, renewed health and prosperity in this life, as well as salvation in the next. Her soothing words set her apart from other evangelists of the time, who emphasized guilt, fear, and denial. She knows how to be compassionate with people because she was crushed and bruised and heartbroken. She was a woman who just ran over with compassion. Do you live in the castle of broken dreams where giant despair and his dark routines are your fabrics of life torn and tattered? She are called her congregation the Church of the Four Square Gospel and she created a community around it, a home for all the lost, battered, displaced souls, like herself. 
when you joined Angela's Temple, you didn't just sign the register and sit in your, in your pew Sunday after Sunday. You were required to do something. You joined a family. You joined a team. You signed a card that said, I'll sing in the choir. I'll teach Sunday school. I'll visit the sick. But everybody believed that they were somebody important and somebody of service. We would get out and march up and down the local streets. We'd get flags and probably wear our white uniform dresses or... Now this involved maybe up to two or three hundred children. And we would end up at Sister McPherson's home and we'd stand there and sing, We Are McPherson's Boys and Girls, until she would come out on the balcony and give us some love, you know, and, and throw kisses to us and talk to us. Amy's devoted community filled the 5,300 seats of Angela's Temple three times every Sunday. Amy reached beyond the walls of her temple, becoming the first media evangelist with her radio station, KFSG. And when those shining silver towers were lifted up above our temple dome and flashed the message east, west, north, and south, our opportunity and privilege was broadened by hundreds of thousands of people. She helped the city of Los Angeles in that respect because many good men got into office because of the radio. And they knew that if they appeared on her program that they would get a lot of votes too. She was very influential. Amy's church services became a major Los Angeles tourist attraction. Her public image glittered like that of a movie star, complete with high-powered cars and glamorous clothes. I thought it was magnificent. Oh, I thought it was classy. Some people didn't think uh, a minister ought to have it that way, but, but we liked it. We think she just looked beautiful. Her dramatic flair and personal charisma won her broader, more popular forums. Sometimes she even shared billing with her Hollywood neighbors, who often visited her services incognito. Just down the road, there were several movie studios. Sometimes the, right out in the middle of the boulevard, there would be a movie scene going on. Adept at media manipulation, Amy began to feel herself above reproach, a celebrity adored by her public. Then, at the height of her success, Amy's shining world came crashing down as she became embroiled in a Hollywood-style scandal that titillated the entire nation. Disappearing from a crowded public beach one afternoon in 1926, she was believed to have drowned. Hundreds helped search for her and two men died in the turbulent waters. It's a very tragic part of our lives, of course. What would happen to anybody who, who, who had lost a mother? You were frightened, bewildered, beset. Reporters hanging on the door, everybody sending condolences, everybody talking about it and starting to say, your mother is, and then changing the word to the, to the word was. One month later, Amy suddenly reappeared. She elaborately recounted her escape from a band of kidnappers who had held her captive in Mexico. But evidence began to turn up that cast doubt on her story. Witnesses claimed they'd seen Amy in a romantic tryst in Carmel, California with a married man, her former radio station engineer, Kenneth Ormiston. Amy's critics were quick to attack. Reverend Bob Schuller wrote a new, scathing 64-page pamphlet that challenged Amy's kidnapping story as total absurdity and concluded, surely the stain of her sin is the deepest that has ever blackened the pages of history. The public devoured her story. The press insinuated that she was guilty by stressing her beauty, sensuality, and unmarried status. The district attorney mounted an investigation. He threatened to charge Amy with conspiracy to produce false testimony. They had nothing. She was innocent. And I might say this never bothered the church. If anything, it pulled the church together like that.
Few people outside of Amy's church, however, believed her story. The DA eventually dropped all charges for lack of evidence, but after nearly a year of press scrutiny and investigation, Amy's public image was devastated. I didn't talk. I just had faith it was all going to come out one way or other, and it did come out properly. Nobody proved otherwise, and uh, it was over. And mother continued, and life went on. But Amy's troubles were far from over. A once loyal group of temple officials made accusations of financial irregularities, church monies funneled to Amy's personal accounts. She promoted several disastrous business enterprises that cost the church thousands of dollars in legal settlements. Amy feuded bitterly with her mother, and for years they didn't speak. Then an acrimonious conflict with her daughter erupted. Roberta had long been groomed to follow her mother to the pulpit, but now they clashed over control of church affairs. Increasingly, Amy cut herself off from the family and church members who had been closest to her. Tired and lonely, she longed for a retreat from her troubles. So she built a new home, a home far beyond her youthful dreams, a lavish villa at Lake Elsinore. She says, I'm with thousands of people in a service. And then she said, uh, I go home and uh, I'm alone. She was lonesome. And you can understand that, uh, but I think she perhaps made a bad choice. Amy was married for a third time to David Hutton, a baritone from one of her sacred operas. And it's all over. We are back again. We've just been married for 12 hours. But trouble surfaced almost immediately. Church members disapproved of Amy marrying while her second husband lived, a violation of Pentecostal church teachings of that era. Hutton's sketchy past was filled with other women, and he antagonized church officials by trying to assume a central role in temple business. Probably the greatest crisis that we ever had. We lost through that some of the very finest of our first generation leadership. She pro is probably the number one mistake that she ever made. And she asked her church to forgive her. But I'm sure that many people out there have their own particular troubles, only mine always somehow unfortunately seem to get into the headlines. There were probably five, I think probably five newspapers in those days. So selling newspapers was a big thing. So I was crossing the street, and I heard this kid yell, Amy does it again. Amy does it again. And I thought, my land, what's this? I just come from the Bible college at noon. I hadn't heard a thing that she'd done, uh, you know, that was unusual. So I walked back to him. I said, uh, what'd she do? And he said, well, I don't know what she did, but it sells papers and just went on. Amy does it again. Her name wasn't even in the headlines. Oh, what are your plans for the future? Well, my plans, as the plans of all of us should be, are in the hands of the Lord and to continue with my church work and to preach the gospel as long as I am able. Do you live in the castle of broken dreams? Gradually, the public wearied of the media circus. During the Depression, Amy's reputation recovered somewhat as she opened a church commissary that fed many thousands of destitute people. Four Square Church aid became more reliable than the city's strained welfare system and reached out to all races and creeds. Her civic contributions were honored by the mayor, police, and fire chiefs. But Amy never rekindled the public's once insatiable fascination with her. She had come to seem a relic from the gaudy decade of the 1920s. In 1944, Amy decided to travel to Oakland, California, making what was by then a rare public appearance, 
to open a new four-square church. And going back to the hotel room that night, she was very happy. She said, son, I've never been happier being back on the evangelistic field. That's, that's where I most long to be. And uh, it was like a fulfillment, not realizing that at that morning she would pass away. Following her death at the age of 54 from an overdose of sleeping pills, ruled accidental, Amy's followers staged a funeral rivaling her greatest services. For days and days, they were backed up clear to Sunset Boulevard when she was lying in state in the temple. Thousands and thousands of people came by. People come by and just cry, said, this is a lady that led me to the Lord. The public remembers her glamour and grandstanding, her scandals, and her lonely fall from grace. But with enormous odds against her, Amy boldly reached for greatness and left an enduring legacy. Her church has survived and flourished. The congregation today numbers 1.2 million in 66 countries around the world. In Los Angeles, the members are a contemporary version of the 1920s migrants, Asian, Latino, Middle Eastern, African American, and many others. They think of Amy as a loving woman who, whatever her faults, left them precious gifts, warmth, community, a home they have long searched for. You can talk about me as much as you please. I'll talk about you down on my knees. You can talk about me as much as you please. I'll talk about you down on my knees. I ain't gonna grieve, my lord, anymore. I ain't gonna grieve. I ain't gonna grieve. I ain't gonna grieve, my lord, Lord has won my heart. 